So welcome everybody. I'm ex I'm super excited to have you all here today, and I'm super excited to bring out who I'm I'm calling the queen, the traction queen, Alex Batdorf, uh, to speak to the hype audience here about building a traction strategy to scale and building a traction strategy like a boss. Um, I've gotten to know Alex pretty well over the last few years. We got introduced from a mutual friend back in like 2018, I feel like. Um, and we had a pretty awesome conversation when she was a guest on my podcast back then. Um, and then we had her again on the show earlier this year, talking through um, different strategies that companies in her accelerator, Get Shit Done Accelerator, had been implementing to gain traction over the last year, despite the pandemic. So Alex is, again, like uh, one of the people in the game who I respect the most. Um, she's crushing it with this accelerator, Get Shit Done. I'll let her talk more about that in a moment. Um, and she, she'll probably explain more on her background, but uh, before Get Shit Done, she was the CMO of Zip Fit Denim, um, which was a hyper growth startup that ultimately she, she exited and the company ultimately was acquired. Uh, and then that just kind of set the groundwork for her to start Get Shit Done. And today she's here to talk to all of y'all about building a traction strategy to scale. Use the chat for conversation throughout. And if you've got a specific question you want Alex to answer, there is a separate button that is called Q&A. Use that so that way we make sure the questions don't get lost in the chat feed and I'll be sure to toss them up. And Alex, would you prefer to answer the questions as they're coming in or do you wanna like save them towards the end? Uh, throughout's fine. All right, cool. So I, I have a feeling the chat log is gonna be bumping. So make sure that you use the Q&A button to ask specific questions for Alex. I will shut up now. Alex, take it away. Hi, everyone. You're, you're getting me at an optimal time because 12 p.m. is when I really like doing stuff like this and interacting with humans. So this is awesome. Um, like Raj said, I am Alex Batdorf. I am the chief get shit done officer, aka shit done queen of um, get shit done. And we'll get into how I got here. But um, yeah, I met Raj in Chicago. I'm a three-time founder. And I started my first two companies, which were in the retail tech e-commerce space in Chicago. I have done the self-funded route. I have done the VC route, raised a butt ton of money when I was in Chicago. That company exited in 2019. Um, and then I ended up probably a year before it exited, moved to New York because I really wanted to discover and uncover these two loud narratives around women entrepreneurship. The first was that it is so hard for women entrepreneurs and there weren't really tangible solutions being offered. And then the other narrative was like, well, if women entrepreneurs just had funding, then all of our problems would be solved, which is absolute bullshit because as someone who has raised before, um, I know that's not the case because the majority of companies, yes, 2% of funding goes to women, but less than 1% of founders in general will get funding. So that's not the problem for most entrepreneurs. That's what we're gonna go through today is it's usually traction. And so we're gonna walk through, let me pull up my presentation. Amazing. Um, we're gonna walk through why traction is so important, but also how do you strategize around traction, <coughs> excuse me, and plan for it. Um, and this is exactly the work we do at Get Shit Done with, sorry for you fellas out there, sorry, not sorry. We do this for women entrepreneurs, but you can use these frameworks. I allow you to use them. Um, so we're gonna talk about how do you build your traction strategy and traction is probably one of the sexiest things that I can think of all day, but also I hope you by the end of this think it's sexy because it will make or break your company. All right, so what is Get Shit Done? We are the superpower scaling sidekick that are helping women entrepreneurs gain traction in their companies so they can scale on their own terms. This is super, super important to us on your own terms part super super important um, because for us when we think of any type of company whether you're going to raise capital whether you're not traction is what is making sure that the market is telling you that you are on to something that you are doing something right that there's demand that you have something people actually care about um, and again oftentimes founders and this is usually not your fault the ecosystem tells us well if you get money from someone, 
that's success. No, an operating company that doesn't need money to survive is successful. And that's what every company, whether you fundraise or not, should really focus on is that even if you didn't have that check-in, you can still run effectively and sustainably. So that's what we focus on with our founders. So why does traction matter? So traction matters for us specifically, and this is an everybody thing, but again, since we focus particularly at Get You Done on women entrepreneurs building scalable businesses, traction matters a lot to us because of 4%. So what does 4% mean? Well, women entrepreneurs make up nearly 50% of entrepreneurs, but our companies bring in around 4% of total business revenues. I'm gonna run that back because everyone needs to understand this. Everybody talks about this 2% stat for women entrepreneurs, 2% of funding goes to women. That's 2% of less than 1% that will go to anybody. But this affects all women entrepreneurs. 4% of our total business revenues are generated from women. And we make up nearly 50% of entrepreneurs. That is fundamentally and systemically the problem. If we don't get over, I don't give a fuck about the funding conversation because it's irrelevant. Traction matters because it's about the sustainability of your business and whether people actually want it. And every entrepreneur, this is not just a woman problem, this is also an any entrepreneur problem, is that traction in your business, again, is what's gonna solidify its sustainability, its ability to scale. If there's actually demand there, that's a, what a check can never, never do for you. And it's really your business model. It's what are people willing to pay for this and are they willing to use it? And you might have a business that's more focused on user generation, that's totally fine. Do you have a wait list? Do you have people that are wanting to sign up or wanting to interact within your community? Do you have engagement stats? That's why traction matters because it tells you that you are on to something. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of story and why, why traction matters so much to me. Again, I'm a three-time entrepreneur. I've been doing this for over a decade now. Um, I started my first company at 19. I'm pretty much unemployable at this point because I've never done anything other than built a business. Um, thankfully, and the God bless my mother who was having a heart attack probably until four years of me being an entrepreneur, was like, oh my God, like, are you going to make it? Alex, we need more black doctors and lawyers. And I'm like, chill, mom. I'm, I'm going to figure it out. Um, but... When I had my last two companies, they were more in the VC back space. <clears throat> the first one was self-funded um, and that one failed. The second one, um, we ended up exiting, like I mentioned. And it's so interesting because Get You Done, now we're intentionally self-funded because this is our legacy. This is my legacy company. And I can tell you that within all of my companies, every single time that I felt successful and that we had momentum, all of them had traction. So example is people are probably saying, well, in the company where you had investors, of course you're gonna have that traction. I'm gonna tell you a little story about that. So we were raising a round in my former company and we had a lead investor. They said they were gonna put in a million and we're getting towards like due diligence, all the contracts are being signed, lawyers are talking to each other. It's basically a done deal. And now I tell founders it's not a done deal until it is wired into your account. Anything can happen because this story is a great testament to it. So we get a call one day right as we're about to pop the champagne saying deals going in. It's a done deal. We get a call from that investor saying, hey, guys, you know, it looks like I'm not going to be able to put in as much as I thought I could. And we're thinking, OK, well, maybe it was supposed to be a million. So maybe 750, 500 at the least, because that's going to really fuck with us. Um, but it should be fine, right? And he comes back and he says, no, we can only put in around 7% of what we initially offered. So we went from a million to 70,000. Even though 70,000 in the grand scheme of things for <coughs> any person, um, especially most people, that's game changing. But given the trajectory and what we were focused on as a company at the time and how we were gonna scale, we were like, how the fuck are we gonna do this now? We needed to hire all these people, we needed to do this and that, and da, 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 da. We had, at that point, since that was supposed to be our lead, and if you're familiar with the funding environment, and even if you're not, that lead investor, everybody wants a lead investor. When you lose your lead investor, and there's lots of investors that will hold out until you have one. So we had one that didn't put in as much, that was a bad signal, even though it had nothing to do with us, it was a bad signal to investors 
and a lot of them ended up pulling out. So what ended up resulting is we <laughs> basically had not that much cash. We had to Airbnb at our, our apartments, move in with boyfriends at the time. Um, I remember a good example of this. I don't know if some of you have seen this. Um, I hope you're not these days. If you are, I empathize with you. But if you've seen it, um, tell me in the chat if you've seen it. I can't see it, but I think many of you probably have been here before. I got this notification almost every day for six months <laughs> after that happened. And it was the most traumatizing time. And we also, mind you, we were an e-com company. So we had jeans. We had to take all of our jeans that were in stores because we had to shut down the stores, take them in stores, put it in a, in a storage unit, and it was unheated. Mind you, this was Chicago. And also that year we were going through a polar vortex. I don't know how many of you are in Chicago um, on, other than Raj, but it's cold as shit. And that year when there was a polar vortex, I mean, we would have to go and there would be freaking orders that would come in one by one. And this is when we were still building up the e-com side. They would be coming one by one. Every time an order came in, we had to drive to the unit and it was not that organized. So we had to dig through all the jeans to try to find that particular item. And sometimes it was just one for the day. <laughs> or we got multiple, we had to keep coming back. And it was freezing. Like I remember leaving and my hands, I couldn't even feel my hands just for one order. But something I can tell you is that was probably the best thing that ever happened for our company at that time because we were hitting numbers. We had like a little bit of funding at the time, but we were so focused on getting the next check that we weren't as focused on the business itself. And when a time like this came, the company could not sustain by itself. And so we had to take a look back and say, it's do or die. I remember having a conversation with my former co-founders about this saying, what are we doing? There was moments where we had four weeks of runway left and we said, are we shutting it down? Are we calling it quits? Are we going in? And we decided to go in and we had to re-strategize and rethink what does it look like at this time for us to own our destiny without relying on a check from an investor? So we started thinking through all the different strategies to produce revenue at the time. So we started thinking about, okay, well, we're an e-com site. We can't spend on digital ads because we ain't got no money. So what's the option? I remember we started, I was Facebook DM, DMing people. Actually, that's how I met my ex-boyfriend. Hey, um, but that's literally because he was like, I remember you tried to sell me jeans. And I'm like, no shame because we needed to bring money in, not only just for the company survive, but also for our own survival, right? So we were DMing people. Then we started thinking, what's a lower cost way for us to get in front of our customers? And we were like, wait, we know that it's proven if you do in-person fittings, like in brick and mortar, it is typically a lower cost for acquisition and it's a higher AOV. So AOV is average order value. So we were like, well, we don't have a space what if we did concierge? What if we went to their homes? What if we made that an option for them where we would send out blasted or current lists saying, hey, if you want a fitting, we will do one-on-one -on -one personalized fittings. And at the time that more, um, like that more bespoke was really in. So people didn't find it as creepy because Airbnb had already been going. People were more comfortable with that. So we started booking so many people. Then we had this idea, I'm like, wait, let's go into, these companies where are where are cu our customers wearing jeans wait like the googles the all of these companies are becoming super um casual who's wearing jeans so at the time we had reached out and we we're like hey let's get into let's try to get into this office then there was a snowball effect we started getting more and more traction <clears throat> and then that was what helped us to dig out not only to get us to a good place as a company but also to go back and have those conversations again with investors. So I mentioned this story because as someone who has self-funded and someone who has also been venture backed is that traction makes everything else irrelevant in your business, period. Like you don't have to be as reliant on all of these things and all of these, these people or forces outside of yourself if you focus on what's in your arsenal and build from there, build off of that momentum. And then you start attracting 
a lot of that. So a lot of the investors and a lot of maybe some of you might not be going after investors and that's great because most of you probably shouldn't anyway. But even if you're self-funded is that it ends up creating that momentum where you have optionality when you get to the table. You can decide what type of partnerships you want because you can say, hey, we have the numbers. We've been able to work with X, Y, and Z, da, 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 da. That's why traction matters so much. Whether you are on the venture track or you are on the self-funded track, it matters. Ooh. So let's talk about what traction is because sometimes people have this question. So traction is anything, again, that is momentum that can move your company forward. So things like top end, it's always increasing revenues. That's top, top, top end. But again, some of you might not be focused on that right now. Maybe you're building more of a, a social platform, like for example, the Facebooks or the Snapchats of the world that they're, they weren't focused on monetization at the time. They were focused on building out their two-sided, they were focused on building out their communities or two-sided marketplaces. And they needed to prove that in order to attract the model of, we're going to sell advertising or we're going to do that. They had to get the numbers there. So it's also increasing res, um, users. It's increasing month over month revenue, MRR or ARR, or annual recurring revenue, um, increasing retentions rates, developing technology. It's anything that proves that there's some momentum here and there's some demand here in what you are bringing to the market. And so because we focus on that and that's all we do at Get Shit Done, we had this theory maybe it's been since we have they had the accelerator maybe it's been a, a little over a year um we went in thinking we're going to try to invalidate whether traction matters and our founders keep validating that it does so in just a little over a year our founders are 25 xing revenue putting 2.5 million in the sales pipeline and this is from someone who went from like literally nothing in the bank to now they're here in just literally nine months um, to securing 100,000 in pre-sales revenue, to increasing users 222%. Mind you, this person was doing this while she was like literally going to give birth to another human or in the process of doing so. Um, increasing retention rates to 75%. Um, I can go on and on and on, but we're gonna actually dig into how you can do this for yourself because again, traction makes everything else irrelevant and it's gonna make you build a very sustainable and scalable business. All right, so before we even dive in, one of our mottos, I get you done, is fuck 4%. And we say that because we want to make sure we usher women through the pipeline in their businesses so they're building on their own terms. We can't do that if we're stuck at 4% of business revenues. This isn't just relevant to women. This is an everybody problem. This is for man, whoever, however you identify. This should matter to all of us because this is economic opportunities and freedom for everybody when we're all doing well the market thrives. So fuck 4%, don't forget that. All right, so what are we here today to do? This is our goal. The first thing is to focus on the traction strategy. We wanna move you from surviving and stuck to thriving. That's the language we hear from a lot of founders and they come to us, it's like, God, I feel like I'm stuck right now. I'm just trying to get to the next place. And <clears throat> the goal is to not make you be in survival mode in your, your company, even though there's so much entrepreneurial bullshit content around hustle, grind, culture. I'm sorry, not sorry, that's not cute. You should not be surviving and stuck. It should not be a badge of honor to be surviving in your company for long periods of time. At the end of the day, there will be seasons that you have to go full force, totally get that. That should not be something that you're doing over years and years, where I remember talking to one of my friends, Helena, for like 10 years plus, she was doing 18 hour days. That's when your company's running you and you're not running your company. And if that's the case, you can work for someone else. We don't want you to be surviving and stuck. We want you to thrive. This is your vision. This is the impact you want to make in the world. You need to thrive within it. The other thing is to help you get focused. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the 80-20 rule or better known as the Pareto principle. This is not even just a business thing. This is in all areas of your life. You'll notice that 20% of your activity produces 80% of your results. Think about fitness, but also in your business. We see a lot of founders that will come to us and they'll be like, oh my God, we're like trying to hit these goals and we're stuck. And we're like, well, walk us through what are all the activities you're doing in your business. They're probably doing like 10 different things that probably most of those need to be cut. And we look under the hood to see what's actually producing the results. That's what you want to focus on when you're a smaller company. And even when you're not small, as you grow too, 
Your ability to get focused as a founder is your superpower. And at every, every juncture of your growth trajectory, you need to be able to say, what is that 80-20? A good example of a big company that's doing this is Amazon. If you notice, Jeff Bezos stepped down and very strategically, because even though let's say Prime is a big part of their business, um, actually the most profitable and the, the biggest growing segment is AWS, which is their cloud system. And it's very interesting if you see who they actually put in the CEO position is the person that launched that. So that's a good example of no matter at what part of your journey, whether you're in the early, early stages, you don't have enough woman power or man power. So you have to get focused so you can do that thing well. But even as you grow, it's being able to get focused on the thing that's working the most so you can continue to grow. And then the other thing is help you measure so you can hit goals and optimize. This is the thing we see so often with founders is they're not measuring shit. So they have all these lofty goals. They're saying, we're gonna hit, you know, we wanna hit 100K by the end of the year. Cool, cool, cool. How are you gonna do that? They don't have KPIs in place. They're not, um, a, a big thing is they're not even attributing the activities they're doing. So they're doing all these things, but they're not able to attribute how is that thing bringing in money? So you might be doing something that is taking up a lot of your time, but it is going against you being able to hit those traction goals. And sometimes there's activities you're gonna do that is not necessarily directly correlated with revenue, but it needs to be tied into the bigger, largest purpose. And so that's why that measurement is important. Whether you're gonna say, we need to get to um, 10,000 email signups, that might not be just um, from your, that might not just be from um, your revenue, but it will leach revenue because you know that if we get these email signups, great, will people get people in the funnel. All right, can so- I, can, I, can I add one thing to that, Alex? Of course. So. I, I need to like, I cannot like echo or stress that point enough. The number of founders I'll speak with, like, you know, they'll show me their pitch deck and they're like, oh yeah, well, you know, we're projecting, it's, it's like, you know, we've, we've got 15K in sales right now. We're projecting 1 million next year. And I'm like, okay, how, <laughs> Yeah. you know? And then it'll be like, oh, we, we have ads. No. And I'm like, okay, but how, <laughs> you know? And the convert, like there, there's not much you can say beyond that. and it's you have got to you have got to be able to like have a detailed way of explaining this activity leads to this output leads to this uh whatever leads to this result and if you don't have that level of clarity you're just like you're just throwing out projections for the sake of saying like oh yeah we're gonna get there somehow some way oh absolutely and it also goes to this um this whole throw shit at the wall. I, I actually hate that. You need to throw things with intention. Otherwise, you're just in a food fight. Like, remember in like your middle school or whatever, people, it's everything's flying everywhere, but you don't know who threw it, where it landed. That is so, there's so much stupid jargon in the startup space that makes me like, eh. And it's always coming from people that have never done it. So I'm like, you're cute. <laughs> I Let's love that analogy. Out. You don't know who threw it or where it came from. <laughs> where did it go? Where did it land? Oh, and my other favorite thing is when founders are using the the ads thing to to raise capital. I'm like, okay, so great. Like, how are you like how are you acquiring customers? How are you getting traction? Well, that's how we need the funding. We need to produce. We need to do ads to acquire customers. That is not what ads are supposed to do. You're not supposed mm -hmm. to find customers through ads. You're supposed to accelerate and find more of who you already know as your customer through ads. Right. I digress though. So <laughs> what we're gonna focus on today is defining your North Star, defining and quantifying your yearly goal, um, defining and quantifying your quarterly goal and defining your KPIs, what those objectives are, meaning what's gonna attribute to hitting those things and also your measurable result. This is a huge thing, measure, measure, measure. I would say when our founders use this framework, um, it blows their mind because they're just like game chain because now with the numbers matched to the, the the activity they're like i can have some weight to this i have a direction where we're going now so that's what we're going to focus on today so if you're ready to work put ready to work in the comments and let's do this okay so this is an older template of what we do with our founders now, but same same type of thing, same whole whole same strategy. Okay, so 
<clears throat> we don't actually do any work with our founders until they go through this process. Again, because I will see founders that they have all these big lofty goals. We are going to have X amount of revenue, X amount of users by this date, but they're really not breaking down how that's going to happen. So there's one thing to have a strategy and a plan, but it's also another thing to say, how are we measuring what success looks like? So this helps our founders get really, really clear about it and it holds them accountable as well to not only hit it, but also see what's working and not so you're not just throwing shit at the wall and doing a ton of things that don't matter. So the first thing we start with is your North Star. We're not gonna spend too much time here, but this is the reason we have this at the top is I personally done this where I forgot why I was doing what I was doing in my company and why what we were doing it for, why it mattered, because that's typically what gets an entrepreneur up every single day. This shit's fucking hard. It is so hard. I'm three companies in and quote unquote successful at it, but I will still have days where I'm like, I want to stay in fucking bed. Like I'm exhausted or this, I, I just, oh my God. My North Star and what we do at Get You Done, why we do what we do is the thing that gets me up and motivated to remember, okay, that's where we're going. But more importantly, when we're choosing activities in the business, we are not choosing out of scarcity, we're choosing out of alignment. Because I see founders that will say, we didn't get all this money in. The issue with that is it will often be a really shiny object that prevents you from doing things well that are in alignment with the actual type of company. Example of this is let's say Microsoft came to us and they said, hey, we love what you're doing. We'd love if you could do this with our male entrepreneurs or just our male entrepreneurs. I could say like if it's a workshop or it's whatever, I'd be like, absolutely not because we're here for women entrepreneurs. Um, so that helps us to stay in alignment. North Star metric for us, you obviously know by now 4%. That's how we measure success. We want to see that number go up every single year, but also the way we measure within our tribe is the outcomes of our founders. Are they increasing revenues? Are they increasing users of we track so much data on our founders that we know from when you came in to when you're leaving and beyond, where are you at? Are you going through the funnel? What's working? What's not? That's really important to us for you and your North star and your North star metric. It's why do we do what we do? And how do we measure success? What's that number? I'll give you another example of Facebook. Facebook, when they started, and your North Star metric will probably evolve over time as you grow and you have new opportunities. When Facebook started, though, their North Star was to connect people in a meaningful way online or whatever it was. The way that they measured that was through <coughs> that they were succeeding was if someone came on the platform their stickiness was if they invited at least seven friends with them. So once they got on, they added seven friends because what that meant was they found it meaningful, they were interacting, but also that network expands other networks because there's probably other people that can connect with the people they invite. So that was their North Star metric. So think through yours. How do you measure, measure success of the big picture? This has nothing to do with revenue, nothing to do with revenue. Now, what does have to do with revenue and users and the business objectives and numbers are your your goals. So let's say, for example, you have um, 100K. Actually, we're going to get to an example of this and where we'll see the actual numbers. But these goals, year and end of quarter, <coughs> these are all tied to your actual business objectives. What you need to hit in the company from a business operations, whether it's revenue or users, that's your goal. So think of these as North Star, North Star metric. This is the big shebang meal. Like we're that's the ultimate meal we've been holding out on. We're, we're going there. We are trying to get to the fanciest restaurant in the world to have the best meal of our lives. Think of these as your your year goal. This is kind of like your New Year's dinner, right? It's that's where we can see friends. We're trying to get there. We're going to feel really good when we get there. Think of your end of quarter goal as like your Christmas dinner or your Thanksgiving dinner. It's we need to get here in order for this to happen. 
the reason we have end of quarter goal is because everything below this, and hopefully you can see it's lit up, everything below this, these objectives have everything to do with your quarter goal. We don't have you focus on the rest of the year. This is why we break it down. This entire sheet is quarterly because so many founders are not, and I've done this before, I see most founders do this, again, ability to get focused. When you're looking at everything on paper, like, ooh, here's all the things that we're trying to do this year, you sometimes aren't able to look at and say, what do we need to do now? This thing now, that's gonna make that thing over there easier, or we couldn't even do that thing until this thing happens. It helps you to get hyper-focused so you can build toward that ultimate goal. So now that you have your end of quarter goal, everything down here is tied to that. So what are objectives? Your objectives are all of these activities you're doing in your company that are gonna make up that end of quarter goal. So let's say if you wanna get to 100K by the end of the year, or M let's say 100K MRR, great. Now you need to attribute it to all the activities you're doing in your company. How are you gonna make that happen? And we're gonna go through some examples on the next tab, but that's what the objectives are. What are the activities? Now, measurable key results, what are these? Measurable key results are what are the steps you need to take in order for you to fulfill this objective? So let's say if you want to, we're going to run email campaigns and it's going to generate $10,000 by the end of the quarter with a 40% open rate and a 3% click-through rate. Great. What needs to happen first? Then next, and then next, and then our founders usually add more steps. We just have that as the template here, but it helps you to really digest the goals you're going after. Think of it like, um, that's why New Year's resolution goals never work for most people, because it's like, let's say a lot of people say, wait, we're gonna, I wanna lose 50 pounds. Okay, but they didn't break down. They, they end up quitting probably after two weeks because they didn't break down, okay, the goal is 50. That quarter goal is 50. What are the objectives that are gonna get me there? One objective is eating well. Okay, what does that look like? I need to have smaller portions. I need to have certain types of foods. I'm only gonna eat these type of greens or I'm gonna eat X amount of greens a month or a week or a day, so on and so forth. The next objective is I need to work out. I need to work out X amount of times a week. I need to do X amount of minutes, so on and so forth. And then you have your KPIs. Your KPIs are the measurements that hold you accountable to these things, so to these objectives. Example of this objective one was about email. Maybe one of the key KPIs is you have revenue, but you also have open rates. These are all things that give you the context to succeed and break down your goals in a meaningful way. So let's actually see what that looks like. Okay, so <clears throat> let's just do an example of what one of these looks like. I'm gonna turn on my AC because it's hot as fuck, hold on. Okay, cool. So what does this look like? This is an example company and let's just say their North Star is number one platform connecting kick-ass queens. I actually named that after one of the happy hours we do for my friend group. So <laughs> we have a happy hour called Kick-Ass Queens and um, this is a made up platform. We wanna, they wanna be the number one platform connecting kick-ass queens to be inspired in their daily lives. Great, how do we measure success? The number of women connected, awesome. That holds them accountable, so now when they're doing and they're creating these goals, they always have the bigger picture connected to it. So what do we need to hit by the end of the, the year for us to feel successful? That's also uh, achievable and attainable. The one thing I wanna call out here, and we'll have our founders that'll ask us this question. Well, shouldn't I shoot for the moon? One of our founders in our last co cohort said this, and I'm so happy she did, she's awesome. She was like, we should shoot for the moon, right? And I'm like, absolutely, absolutely. However, how much fuel do you have to get to the moon? And you might have to make stops. Everybody's gonna have to make stops. It's kind of like going on a road trip across I don't know, let's say the US from, I'm in New York, maybe I was trying to go to LA. I would not be able to get there off of one, like one gallon or 
just one fill up of fuel. I would need multiple. So if I'm saying this is where we're ultimately going to go, this is one of the first stops, pit stops that we need to get to to get to that final destination. So the end of let's say the end of 2021 goal is achieve 100,000 ARR. They're saying through ticket sales and connect 500 queens. And then the end of this quarter goal is achieve 30,000 revenue through ticket sales and connect 125 queens. What this enables you to do is break down that much larger goal and give you relief to say that in this quarter, this is what we need to focus on to get there versus looking at that big daunting number and saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, how are we gonna get there, how are we gonna get there? You're saying in this quarter, I think this is what we can achieve. And if you achieve that, that means you have X amount left. So if they hit the end of Q1 goal, that means for the rest of the year, three quarters left, they have 70,000 left and they get to distribute how much they can achieve throughout the rest of the quarters um, from there. But it helps you to break it down. And when we do this with our founders, we notice that they are just so relieved. They're like, oh my God, okay, I can actually do this. Or some of them are just like, okay, let me get my shit together because I'm trying to do the most. Like Raj said earlier, we're gonna get to a million by the end of the year, but there's no rhyme or reason for how they're gonna do it because they don't have enough fuel to get there. Maybe that can be another year, the next year. But this year, it's being okay with and grateful and celebrating where you're at so you can get to where you're trying to go. So that's how you break it down this way. Now, again, the rest of this, all of these objectives have everything to do with this end of Q1 goal. And they hold you accountable to attributing where that money is coming from. So if they said 30,000, awesome. Objective one is what are they gonna do? Get 10 distribution partners by X date, resulting in 5,000. Awesome. What are the measurable key results? The first thing they need to do is we need to research partners by a certain date. Okay, awesome. Now let's create a list of partners by a certain date too. Dates help you as well because it holds you accountable not to just put it on your to-do list. It helps you to focus your to-do list every day on what actually needs to happen versus just trying to hop around. So they're gonna create that list. Now they have that list, they're gonna reach out to these partners. Then conversion rates. We're gonna convert 40% of outreach to calls by this date and then 25% to partners by the 30th. So if you notice here, the really big thing is if you have something like sales list or business development, we'll have founders that are like, oh, we're gonna reach out to 25 people and we're gonna convert 25. That's probably not the case. <laughs> and if it is, amazing for you, great, that's amazing. That's usually not the case. You're probably gonna get some no's because that's how sales work. The conversion rate is low, but that's just how it, that's just how it goes. So you need to really create cushion for if assuming we can convert X percent, how many people do we need to reach out to? How many organizations do we need to reach out to? How many companies do we need to reach out to in order to get to that ultimate conversion goal? If we're assuming we can only convert a certain percentage, that's super important. So you're not selling yourself short because 100% conversion is very, very rare. So now they have 5,000 here. Cool, we're at 25,000. Where's the, re the 25,000 additional coming from for the rest of the quarter? They said 10,000 is gonna come through ticket sales. Amazing. Well, what does that look like? They wanna partner with influencers. They're gonna pay $1,000 per influencer, but also it's not just saying we're gonna pay that influencer 1,000. What are we assuming? What do we think it's gonna generate per influencer? So let's say we pay them a thousand. We're gonna get, or not, a, we're not gonna pay them a thousand. They're gonna get a thousand dollars per influencer. My bad. Um, so a thousand dollar per influencer is gonna come from there. So let's say that for each influencer, they're assuming there's gonna be $125 per um, ticket sale. That's the average. They're assuming that eight orders are gonna come per influencer. That gets them to that 10,000. And again, breaking it down to, well, what do we need to do to make this happen? Great, we need to, oh, this needs to be updated. I think this was an old one. 
the math's probably not adding up here because I think we added it and did some, we were doing some work with some of our founders to make a point. But anyways, um, measurable key result is we need to create a list of 30 micro influencers. Mind you, again, their goal is 10. They're going to reach out to 30 because they're assuming that they're going to get a certain percentage. They're going to get a third that are actually going to convert. Awesome. Reach out to those people by that date, convert X percent, gift them by this date, share the chat code, boom. We are gonna assume by this date we're gonna get to those, those sales. Awesome. Now we have 15,000 left to hit the rest of this goal. Also, most companies have more than three objectives. This is just an example, but also we tell founders you shouldn't go over giving your woman power, man power on your team. Be very realistic with the activities you're doing, how much time it takes, and what you can actually accomplish. I've been doing this for over a decade, and three companies in, I still have to check my own ass to be like, girl, you are doing the most. Like, your team can't handle that. Reel it in. You're going to have to start here. So, objective three for them was the rest of the 15000 for the rest of the quarters coming from we're going to launch a customer nurturing drip email campaign because let's say their emails are on fleek, people are really engaging, awesome. So we're gonna drive ticket sales through email. <clears throat> we're assuming $155 on average, that's what AOV is, average order value, is gonna come from email. And we're assuming we're gonna get 97 orders, that's gonna get us to that 15,000. Again, step by step. First is analyze the top products they have um, and tickets for them, it's ticket sales. So what can they what can they hype up what are the products they're going to put in this email to drive those ticket sales then they're going to set up the let's say they need new email software set up to help with hyper targeting and segmentation that needs to happen and a lot of times what we'll see founders do if you notice some of these things have a number attributed there's also going to be things that don't that i find for a lot of founders because i know for me it's really annoying when we have to do the operational things that don't immediately tie to revenue, I'm like itching. I'm like, oh my God. Like I tell my team all the time, I'm like, I hunt and kill. I do not want to cook. I don't want to cook. I want to go hunt and I want to kill. But in order for you to hunt, kill, and be able to cook it effectively, you need to have certain systems and structures in place for it to be effective. So make sure that if there are things that need to be optimized from an operational perspective, you have those things in place and you're accounting for that. And if it might take you two weeks to three weeks, okay, but do not play yourself and leave those things out and just try to go. Again, throw shit at the wall to throw it out the wall, or I call it leaky bucket, is that you're trying to add all this purified water into a bucket that's leaking and you haven't stopped the leak yet. And so you're just losing all these valuable resources. So make sure to add those things in. Then they say, we're gonna create a win back campaign and then we're gonna launch it by this date. These are just hypotheticals and examples of how to do it. But ultimately, this is how I want all of you to be thinking about your businesses and thinking about traction and being able to achieve your traction goals because it's not enough to just say, we are going to achieve 10,000 or 30,000 this, this quarter. How are you gonna do it? What is gonna move the needle? What are the steps and how do we end up <clears throat> measuring that we are succeeding or we're on the right track or better yet, that we might be on the wrong track because I often see that also founders are just doing things to do them and they should have pro they probably should have stopped doing one activity years ago, I'll give it, or not years ago, months ago, I'll give an example of one of our founders. She, Lauren, she was, um, she's a, a like the real real for equestrians and I remember when she started in the accelerator she was like okay Alex like there's this one part of the business that is daunting and it's a pain in my ass and the, it's a business development and the brands are really getting on my nerves but I know I need to keep it because I feel like it's a big portion of the business and I was like well Lauren let's look under the hood here because again this goes back to your 80 20 there is probably 20 percent of your activity producing 80% of your result. And there's probably, if you're not doing, if you're doing it backwards, which a lot of founders are, there's probably something taking up 80% of your time that's producing 20% of your results. You need to cut that shit quick. This was an example of that. Lauren 
literally was like, I have to keep this thing because they're big brands or big names. So I was like, let's just do a test. Let's go look in your analytics and see how much revenue that, that, that channel is actually bringing in for you. And she was nervous. She did it though. And she was like, holy shit. And I was like, what? She was like, it's only bringing in 5% of my revenue. That day, it was such an easy decision for her because she could see the number. She was like, fuck that. She like put a, together a whole like email saying, here are the new rules of this program. If you're on board, you're on board. If you're not, you're not. And from there, she was able to increase revenues 30 to 40% month over month consecutively for months. Then from there, in the pandemic, she acquired another company because she had the cash to, and they were going out of business. And then from July and August of 2020, those two months alone were all of her total revenues from the previous year. And so that's why measurement matters because it helps you to take, because your gut feeling as a founder is your superpower, but it can also like kick you in the ass and not allow you to move away from something um, as quickly as you can because you might feel so emotionally attached to it. That's why measurement matters here. But this is how I want you all to think through your traction strategies. It's really gonna help you hit your goals. Our founders fucking crush it and they use this not only in our program but beyond. And this becomes a part of how they, um, they end up conditioning their muscle for hitting traction goals. But I'm gonna stop talking because I can talk about this for fucking days. Um, and I'll answer any questions you have. So this is awesome. Um, I had a question that was sent directly to me. So everyone just make sure you put the question in the Q&A button. Uh, or I mean, at this point, you could use the chat as well if you want. Um, so one of the questions or the question that I got was in building out that traction strategy, how do you, um, I'm just trying to make it into a question. Uh, how, how do you uh, basically decide what's a legitimate number or what's what you could actually achieve versus not achieve this is kind of like projections right you there's no silver bullet the more i will say the more history you have in your company of an activity you've done you can start making more um stronger guesstimates right because you have historical data let's say you're really new and you don't have historical data it's really about just saying what do, what feels good example of this i was talking to a founder the other day who had interviewed for our accelerator and she was kind of guessing like well maybe we can do well maybe five thousand five thousand mr and i was like five i'm like is that going to help hit certain like pay for certain things and she's like no we probably need to be at 10 and then i was just like go look at your numbers go look at what you need to do in order for you to not only operate this company, but also you not just surviving. And being able to say of that activity, if you have a certain email list, look at how people have interacted with you. Have you tested selling before? And if you did, what did it look like? How many things did you sell? Um, what were the conversion rates? And what would it look like if you keep testing? Mind you that there's no silver bullet. So you might have a goal and it might not happen. But that's okay. It's like, how do you create the frameworks for you to try to achieve it and test and optimize towards it? Or you might exceed it. We've had founders that like, I would say it's 50-50. We have some that uh, they kind of fell where they thought, um, well, it's, it's not 50-50. Like we have some that go below and they're like, okay. But what that allowed them to do was shift and say, we thought this channel was going to uh, contribute to X amount of revenue. It didn't, however, this channel over here is kicking ass. That goes back to your 20, your 80, 20. Your goal with this framework is to try to understand what is moving the needle the most and putting your energy behind it. That's why creating those numbers, even though they're not silver bullets, helps you to get realistic. And over time, as you keep testing and optimizing, you can start getting more solidified answers around what is an actual good goal to set based on how you've performed in the past. And that's really important. It's, it's benchmarks, right? And yeah. then you have new benchmarks to work off of. And one of the things I'll see to, to that point, you mentioned about like, you know, hey, does that even like give you enough money to do, you know, whatever thing. Uh, the companies who I work with who are raising capital 
and I'll, you know, we'll be like, okay, well, how much are you raising? And, I, and I'm not there to be like their finance expert. I just have to like ask the question, I'm like, okay, how much are you raising? Let, let's say they're like, oh, like 160K, 150K is what we're going to ask for in our round. And I'm like, okay, so how's that going to be allocated? And then they'll yep. tell me, and I'm like, okay, have you accounted for any one of those things not going to plan or, or going wrong or screwing up along the way? Yep. And they'll be, they'll be like, uh, I'm like, okay, you should probably ask for more than the bare minimum that's going to get you by. You need you need f it up money, right? Especially, yes. especially in the capital raise. You need process. buffer. You need buffer, <laughs> and it's okay. Like there's no silver bolt. That's why it's always really funny when I speak to founders around. Like, let's say they're trying to build their projections for investors, and investors will literally tell me they're like, "We know for early stage companies, projections are bullshit because you have no performance. You don't have enough to really go off of what it is." And one of my favorite investors. Um, Ali, she's at X Factor. She literally, and she's a former founder herself. She was like, you know what projections help me to understand for founders? And this is beyond just investors. I think founders need to treat themselves like investors. Is that it helps me to see that the founder thought logically and thoughtfully around how they're going to use my money. Because otherwise, I'm not giving you play money. This is not charity. This is a business for me. And it is your business to make sure that you not only operate effectively for yourself and the impact you want to make, but also if you have shareholders, you have a fiduciary responsibility. This isn't play money for you just to go and figure it out. You need to have thought thoughtfully through it and give it some weight and context. And you yeah, should, yeah. even if you're not looking for capital, every founder, you are your own investor, treat yourself like one. Treat yourself seriously. I like that a lot. And that comes, I mean, especially with an investor, right? Like you have to be able to show how is this not risky or how is this the least amount of risk of all the options you have in front of you. And if right. you can't say anything around, well, here's our traction strategy, probably not gonna go very far. Um, yep. Can you talk to, um, like, let's say you achieve the goal actually, like maybe you set the bar kind of low, but you didn't realize it and you achieve the goal quicker. How quickly do you then like, I guess, redo your strategy or do you just be like, well, now it's all gravy and we'll reset it when we get to the next quarter or whatever? No, great question. Bump it up, bump it up. So we have this with founders where they're like, whoa, I did not expect that thing to work as well as it did. That is, these are first world great problems to have, right? So now it's saying, let's go back and adjust that number. And th that's what I say. And yes, we'll share, I'll, I'll share the sheet with um, Raj, but that's what we tell our founders like that that sheet is a living breathing document it is not meant to be a like like jail sentence like this is the only way it happens you might say we maybe did a little less or we over like we just killed it knocked it out of the park and as you're seeing those numbers that's why creating those kpis and attribution matters because then you can start making really strategic decisions around where you spend your time, but more importantly, can we bring in more instead of pigeon your holding yourself to just one way of doing things? And I'll see founders, this is a people thing, is that we get so stuck in how we think it should look that we get in our own way and shoot ourselves in the foot that we don't create room for opportunity to actually come in and whether it's pivot or just say, no, we can actually bring in a little more. We have a little more room and buffer to kind of push this to the limit. All right, we are at time. I appreciate everyone for joining today. So yes, you'll get that Google sheet. Um, you'll also get the recording from today. Just, you know, it takes like an hour to process after this ends, then I got to upload it to YouTube. So just expect later today, you'll get an email from me with the recording and then the link to the spreadsheet as well. And then um, Alex will be in touch with all y'all as well with information on, with more information on Get Shit Done and how you can get involved in her community. Alex, any parting shot you got for everyone? Um, give yourself a fucking break. Honestly, <laughs> I think like, I could, I could say just go do it, and da, da, da. I think we're all fucking exhausted. We are just now defrosting from a pandemic, and we're still in it. Like, give yourself <laughs> grace. I find there's so many people pulling their fucking like hair out. Cause I had one founder, actually, Lauren was an example of this. She was like is it she called me the other day she's like is it bad that i wanted to be in bed all of may and i'm like no because shit's happening in the world so give yourself grace give yourself a break and 
this allows you to do that like be realistic but also again shoot for the stars but understand how much fuel you have and also taking fuel doesn't just mean in your business and the bodies it also means mental capacity spiritual capacities there's so much to it and do not beat yourself up over it we've gone through a lot in the last year so give yourself a fucking break you're doing just fine give yourself a break and my parting shot building off of that is um celebrate your wins even when they're small so you can actually feel good about what you're doing as you're doing it i realized uh, earlier this year, I was like, I never actually pause when something good happens. I just go, I just keep going and I go into the thing. And, and now what I do every time I win a new customer, it's going to look ridiculous, but I literally, I push my chair back and I go, woo, <laughs> just so I can physically feel <laughs> good that. about it. And then I have an agreement with my wife where anytime, I, no matter how big or small the customer is, we either like get like takeout that night or we go out and have a drink or something like that, but we do something to, to enjoy progress. Oh, I love that. Monica, uh, Monica Black, I don't know if she's in Chicago, if you go know her. Yeah, I know her, yeah. She's amazing. I remember she told me when I resigned from my last company and was starting to get shit done, she was like, I, cause I'm such a hyper achiever. And I'm sure if you're an entrepreneur, you are, you're a hyper achiever, you're shoot for the stars. You're like, I have to get there and you're hyper critical on yourself. I would literally create benchmarks and say, I'm going to do that. And then when I would do it, it, I just was like, okay, check next thing. And I would not celebrate it. So she gave me something and I offer to you basically, basically piggybacking off of what Raj said is breathe through your celebrations. Cause I noticed I was holding my breath to go to the next thing. I'm like, okay, that thing's done. <gasps> Hold my breath to the next thing. Happened. I know that feeling. Oh my God. And I'm just like, oh my God. And then I started associating anxiety with producing and I could never enjoy the process and what I was doing. And I'm still unlearning that. So uh, yes, I totally agree with you. Like breathe through your celebrations, like celebrate. I like it. Woohoo. I'm, I'm, I'm figuring out a new way for me to do it. Um, but you just gave me a good idea. So I love that. <laughs> All right. Thank you everyone. Alex, appreciate it.